The Space Age was undoubtedly one of the most exciting periods in world history. But while everyone knows about Neil Armstrong and his accomplishments, less well known are the accomplishments of all those working behind the scenes, especially the women of West Computing, an all-black computing pool located on the west end of the Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Unlike Neil Armstrong, the work of these women and their contribution to the space race was relatively unknown, that is, until the release of Margaret Lee Shetterly's 2016 book, Hidden Figures, which chronicles the lives of these brilliant women. Despite being Miss Shetterly's first book, Hidden Figures actually made it to the number one spot on the New York Times non-fiction bestsellers list, and of course it spawned a movie which is the subject of today's video. Movies based on books tend to get a bad rap, though to be honest, when you transfer a story from one medium to another, you're going to be faced with some tough choices, and chances are that sections of the written work are going to have to be dropped, and I get that. But in the case of Hidden Figures, I find myself questioning their choices just a little bit. The book that the film is based on is actually fairly short, about 270 pages, but this didn't stop the filmmakers from cutting almost 50% of the book's content. The shortage of manpower at Langley during World War II, the hiring of black computers to make up for said lack of manpower, and the subsequent creation of the West Computing Pool as well as all the work and contributions that the woman of West Computing made to the field of aeronautics, is dropped from the script entirely. Instead, the film starts by giving us a glimpse into the early life of Katherine Coleman, a young woman from White Sulphur Springs of West Virginia who possesses a brilliant mathematical mind, capable of vaulting her ahead several grades. Not unlike her movie counterpart, the real Katherine Coleman showed such a strong aptitude for learning that by 1931, not 1926 like in the film, as she would have been 8, do the math movie, at 13 she started attending high school classes at West Virginia State College, a historic institute of higher learning which doubled as the only black high school in the vicinity of Sulphur Springs. Flashing ahead a mere 35 years, we see three black women stranded on the side of the road. These three women, Katherine Coleman, now Katherine Gobe, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson, are computers employed by the Langley Research Center. While they're working on the car, a police officer pulls up, and as this is 1961 Virginia, the officer proceeds to berate the women for breaking down on the side of the road. However, when he finds out that the trio work at Langley, he decides that he too must do his part to help defeat the communist threat, keeping in mind that this is in the midst of the space race between the United States and Russia, and decides to give them a police escort to work. It's always so heartwarming when xenophobia wins out over racism, isn't it? What follows is a rather hilarious, albeit very historically inaccurate chase scene where the three women speed through town while trying frantically to keep pace with the police officer. After waxing philosophically about how strange the scene must look from the outside, i.e. a car full of black women chasing a white cop in 1961 Virginia, the three women arrive at West Computing. For those of you who haven't read the book, and have never seen a computer that you don't have to plug in, so basically anyone born after 1985, the term computer was originally used to describe people, often women, who crunch numbers using calculating machines. In 1943, spurred on by the demands of World War II, the Langley Laboratory started employing two pools of computers, the East Computers and the West Computers the latter of which was a segregated pool of all black women. These computing pools were divided into sections, each of which was headed by a section head, who reported to a supervisor. When an engineer needed computing work done, he would send it to the supervisor, who would then send the assignments to the section heads, who would then send them on to the computers. However, if an engineering group decided that they liked the work of a particular computer, whether Caucasian or African American, they had the option of asking them to join their group. This is what happens to both Catherine and Mary, as both women are assigned to engineering groups after a stint working in West Computing. Though the details regarding exactly how this happened are not quite as simple as they are portrayed in the film, but I'll have to circle back around to that later. 
Unlike her friends, however, Dorothy's path to career advancement is being blocked by a rather racist member of the Langley supervising staff, who refuses to promote her to the position of full supervisor, despite the fact that she is currently the acting supervisor of West Computing. While the real Dorothy Vaughn was appointed to the position of unofficial supervisor of West Computing in 1949, it would take two years of tireless dedication and hard work before she was awarded official status in 1951. The film is also probably correct in assuming that Dorothy's race was a factor in delaying her promotion to full supervisor. After all, she was the first African American supervisor in the history of Langley. However, while the movie receives historical accuracy points for its portrayal of Miss Vaughn, her supervisor, Vivian Mitchell, does not seem to be based on an actual historical figure. Unlike the film, the book very seldomly highlights individual acts of racism, preferring to focus on the much broader problem of segregation and discrimination that existed during the woman's time at Langley. Were there racist supervising staff at Langley? Maybe. Probably. But you can't forget that Langley not only enforced racial segregation, but was also located in Virginia, a state which, at this time, was not exactly well known for its tolerance. But it seems that Dorothy is not the only one having a tough time at work, as Catherine is struggling to find acceptance in her new surroundings. While most of her new co-workers give her the cold shoulder, Catherine also finds that there are no black bathrooms in her new building forcing her to run back to West Computing every time she needs to relieve herself. This is actually kind of hilarious, because when the real Catherine Gobe was first assigned to the Flight Research Division in 1953, just two weeks after starting her employment with West Computing, she didn't realize that the bathrooms were segregated. While there were black bathrooms located outside of West Computing, they were few and far between, and because the non-segregated washrooms in the Flight Research Division weren't marked, Catherine had no idea that she wasn't allowed to use them. Catherine apparently continued doing this for years, until a colleague informed her about these segregated washrooms. However, by this point, she refused to change her ways, and it seems that her co-workers did little to press the issue. Mary Jackson, on the other hand, had a very different experience with the segregated washrooms at Langley. On her first day working with her new engineering group in 1953, she asked her fellow computers, all of whom were Caucasian, where the washrooms were. Her question was met with chuckling as her co-workers informed her that they had no idea where her bathroom was. This forced Mary to go on a long and somewhat aggravating search for a washroom, and on her way back to West Computing later that day, she ran into Kazimira Sarnecki an assistant section head in the 4x4 foot supersonic pressure tunnel. Still fuming about the bathroom incident, Mary unloaded all the anger and frustration she was feeling on Zarnecki. And since he was a really great guy, he decided to invite her to come work with him instead. So yeah, rather than being assigned to Zarnecki's group like she is in the film, Mary Jackson unloaded all her frustrations on a random stranger and ended up getting a new job. I would, however, not recommend doing this at your place of employment, as I'm sure the outcome will be very different. While Mary Jackson's bathroom story bears more than a passing similarity to Catherine's ordeal in the film, Catherine's impassioned speech about her daily run to the washroom and her boss's decision to publicly disband the segregated washrooms are both film additions. I should also probably mention that Langley disbanded all its segregated facilities in 1958, a full three years before this movie is slated to take place in 1961. Movie Catherine, not like her real life counterpart, is a widower with three daughters, her husband James Gope having died in 1956 of an inoperable brain tumor. Also, just like in the film, while attending a choir practice at Carver Memorial Church, Catherine was introduced to James A. Johnson, a 33-year-old war veteran who had recently moved to Hampton. While the real Catherine seems to have been quite smitten with Mr. Johnson during their first meeting, the movie instead decides to employ a much more tired romantic cliché, as Mr. Johnson unintentionally insults Catherine by questioning how she could be sued for a job at Langley. Catherine is understandably upset by this and counters his accusation by listing her many academic achievements before rushing off. I think I speak for most of humanity at this point when I say that, as a species, we are sick of this cliché and hope it dies a painful and fiery death in the near future. 
On the other hand, the movie does get historical accuracy points for working in Catherine's academic bio, including the fact that she was the first black woman ever to enroll as a graduate student at West Virginia University. Back at work, Dorothy and the rest of West Computing soon discover that Langley has purchased a series of IBM electronic computers. Each one guaranteed to perform calculations in a fraction of the time it would take a human computer, a fact which could spell trouble for them. But never one to give up without a fight, Dorothy decides to learn as much as possible about the IBM computers, and she encourages all the women in West Computing to do the same. In reality, Langley bought its first pair of IBM computers in the mid-1950s. Though their purchase did not put the human computer's jobs in immediate danger, as there was still no shortage of work for them to do. The human computer's continued job security was also bolstered by the fact that the IBM machines were not 100% accurate, meaning that human computers would still need to double check their work. While West Computing was eventually abolished in 1958, rather than being issued pink slips, the remaining computers were instead redistributed amongst engineering groups and the newly established Analysis and Computing Division. It is true, however, that Dorothy Vaughn believed that continued job security at Langley would depend on developing a working knowledge of computers. So when Langley sponsored a series of computing courses, Dorothy was among the first to sign up, encouraging all of her computers to do the same. This is admittedly quite different from the film's depiction of events, where Dorothy learns everything she needs about computers from a book that she steals from the Hampton Public Library. Would public libraries even have that many books about computers in 1961? Dorothy's knowledge of computers comes in handy, however, as it seems that the employees tasked with setting up the IBM have no idea what they're doing, leaving her to solve the problem on her own. While the scene makes Dorothy look like a genius, not only is there no mention of this in the book, but it seems very strange that IBM didn't send staff to help set up the computer. Dorothy is not the only one on the fast track to career advancement, as Mary Jackson, spurred on by her boss, Kazimira Zarnecki, or Mr. Z as he's known in the film, has decided to become an engineer. However, before she can get her degree, she must first take a few night courses at Hampton High School, a white segregated school. This is a problem because, as her friends are quick to remind her, the state of Virginia likes to pretend like Brown versus the Board of Education never happened. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, in 1954, during the Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka case, the Supreme Court deemed that the segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional, thus forcing schools in America to integrate. This did not go over very well in Virginia, however, as many people did everything in their power to stop schools from integrating. For instance, just a few years later, in 1958, Virginia's governor, Lindsay Almond, forcibly closed any schools that attempted to integrate, even going so far as to chain their doors shut. Not unlike her real-life counterpart, Phil Mary petitioned the city of Hampton for special permission to attend the school. Mary gets a court date and convinces the judge to allow her to attend the night classes. Though I'm unable to guarantee the accuracy of her speech, as the book bears no mention of it. The film also fails to recount the shock that Mary feels upon first seeing the inside of Hampton High School. When she first entered the school in the 1950s, Mary discovered that the institution that she and her children had been forbidden from entering was not some incredible institute of higher learning, but a dilapidated and crumbling building no better than the school black students were forced to attend. Returning to the subject of Catherine's love life, after he brings her a container of soup, Catherine seems to completely forget the fight she had with Colonel Johnson, and the two begin dating. After what we can assume is a fairly brief period of courting, being that the film starts in 1961 and ends with mission MA6 in 1962, the colonel decides to pop the question and the two are married in a small ceremony at Carver Memorial. Despite the dates, this on-screen romance closely mirrors that of the real-life romance between Catherine and James Johnson, as a brief period of dating was soon followed by a marriage proposal and a small wedding in the summer of 1959. Back at Langley, it seems that, despite everyone's hard work, the good old USFA is still second in the space race, as on April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human being in space, as well as the first human to orbit Earth. 
The United States and by association Langley responded by sending up Alan Shepard in May of 1961, making him the first American in space, followed by astronaut Gus Grissom. In the midst of all this, Catherine is still fighting to secure a place at Langley. As while her boss and colleagues have come to trust and depend on her work, she still isn't allowed to attend the NASA briefings, despite the fact that these meetings often generate information that is crucial to her work. While Catherine's colleague argues that there is no protocol for women attending the briefings, Catherine eventually convinces her boss that attendance is essential for her work and she is granted permission, much to the surprise of everyone in the room. While Catherine's fight to attend the NASA briefings is featured in the book, it doesn't come across as quite as important as it is in the film. In the book, it's made clear that Catherine doesn't want access to the briefings because it's essential to the performance of her job, she just wanted access because she's curious. After all, the rest of her colleagues had access to the briefings, so why can't she attend? The main reason for her lack of attendance in the book is still cited as her gender, but it honestly isn't that big of a problem. She asked to be let into the briefings, her colleagues recant their position, and she's allowed in. Seriously, the entire thing boils down to like a few paragraphs in the book. Moving back to the film, it seems as though the United States is finally catching up to Mother Russia, as the next mission, MA6, or Mercury Atlas 6, is going to be an orbital flight around the Earth, piloted by astronaut John Glenn. However, on the day that Glenn is set to take off, it's discovered that there is an inconsistency with the calculations generated by the IBM computer. This inconsistency prompts Glenn to ask Catherine, or that girl as he so eloquently calls her, to check the numbers. This puts the fellows at Mission Control in a bit of a pickle, as due to the introduction of the IBM computer, Catherine was relieved for duties as a computer and sent back to West Computing. The team quickly locate Catherine, who confirms the computer's numbers before rushing back to Mission Control to relay the information to Glenn. While liftoff goes smoothly, on his third orbit around the Earth, it is discovered that Glenn's heat shield is loose, a problem that if not dealt with, could cost him his life upon re-entry. But Catherine Johnson, now at her new seat in Mission Control, tells them not to jettison the shell's retro rocket pack with the hope that it will keep the loose heat shield in place. Despite a tense few minutes of radio silence, Catherine's plan is successful and both Glenn and the shuttle land unharmed. Oh, so many historical inaccuracies. First, Catherine was never fired from her job because, as I stated previously, human computers were still needed after the introduction of the IBM machines. Also, while it's true that Catherine was asked by John Glenn to check the numbers on his launch, his reason for doing this was not because of an inconsistency in the computer's calculations, but rather a distrust of computers in general. While computers are an integral part of our society today, in 1962, computers were a new and fairly untested piece of technology. So it made sense that Glenn wanted the numbers double-checked by a human computer that knew her stuff. Catherine's check also took place well before the launch, so there was no sense of urgency like there is in the film. Also, if the issue really had been that urgent, I'm sure that someone else could have checked the numbers, as they did have an entire building of mathematicians at the ready. Also, since when was Mission Control at Langley? In reality, Mission Control was located at the launch site in Cape Canaveral. They did this, I assume, so the fellows at Mission Control could be nearby in case something went wrong, like, I don't know, the shuttle bursting into flames? And finally, while the film claims that Catherine brilliantly decided to use the shuttle's retro rocket pack to secure the loose heat shield, saving both the mission and John Glenn's life, in reality, the heat shield dilemma was furiously debated among the members of Mission Control, before flight director Chris Kraft and mission director Walter C. Williams decided to keep the retro rocket pack in place during re-entry. Also, according to NASA's website, it was later discovered that the heat shield wasn't actually loose, as a faulty switch in the shield circuit indicated that the clamp holding it had been prematurely released. The movie then ends by giving us some final facts about our trio of brave rocket women. But here are a few additional facts. Mary Jackson became NASA's first black female engineer in 1958. However, in 1979, she gave up her position as an engineer to become the federal woman's program manager at NASA. 
In her new position, Mary Jackson worked to improve the hiring and promotion rate of female mathematicians, engineers, and scientists until her retirement in 1985. Dorothy Vaughan became West Computing's first official black supervisor in 1951, a position which she maintained until West Computing was disbanded in 1958. Dorothy then joined NASA's Analysis and Computing Division, where she became an expert in Fortran programming and contributed to the Scout Launch Vehicle Program. Unfortunately, despite her efforts, Dorothy was not granted another management position at NASA before she retired in 1971. Katherine Johnson's long list of achievements include her work on Apollo's lunar lander, the Moon Orbiting Command and Service Module, the Space Shuttle, and the Earth Resource Satellite. She authored and co-authored 26 research reports in an era where, for a woman, such an achievement was deemed virtually unheard of, and 29 years after her retirement, in 2015, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. Well, that's it for this episode of Movie vs. History. I would love to tell you more about the history of these amazing women and how they contributed to the moon landing, but the film decided that it wasn't really that important. If this video has lit a fire under your butt and you want to learn more about the women of West Computing, then I strongly recommend that you read Margaret Lee Shelley's book, as it provides much more detail about the lives of not only these women, but many of their co-workers as well. One of my favorite stories has to do with a woman named Miriam Mann and her battle with the segregated sign in the Langley Cafeteria. It's inspiring, but also quite funny. Well, until next time, this has been Silver Jade saying remember to support your local library and I'll be seeing you.